this book is a deeply personal book it it is talking about a humane side of china and me as an indian looking at china and finding a little bit of india in it i had traveled uh, extensively in china and uh, as the subtitle suggests it's about traveling to the less obvious places in china not not in eastern coastal china but in interior china in the in the western part of china in china's heartlands or on the periphery some people even told me that as you move away from china's glittering coastline as you move away from the skyscrapers of shanghai and beijing and go westwards you know to to the to to central china or interior china it's a kind of gentler china that is sort of lost in the coastal cities you don't find it anymore Well in the last decade I've written more than 75 articles for various Indian and Asian publications. I've written about political and economic issues and I would not have been able to to understand China if I didn't speak Chinese. So yes there I was traveling and talking and interacting trying to understand the pulse of China sometimes getting lost and sometimes being judged sometimes having good experiences and sometimes having very bad experiences in china that put a perspective on china which it has been very very precious and i wanted to make a part of my experience and my journey and my understanding and uh, what i know about china i wanted to make it accessible to the common person like you and me Well this is for somebody who is inquisitive who is curious who wants to know a little bit better about India and about China in fact because it's not about all the places that you've heard of you know China's economic miracle China's economic rise the golden cities of China it's not about them it it gives or represents a side or diversity of china that is less known so if you are a curious reader if you have an inquisitive mind if uh, you want to know china a little bit better then this is the book for you thank you thank you very much i am totally and absolutely delighted to be here and uh, thank you roland for enabling me this as you can see is what the book looks like an indian girl in the middle of a crowded street in china a metaphor for finding india and china on the right hand side you can see this little sign board it's crawled with chinese characters with chinese calligraphy it reads zai chung ko shun chao indu the yangzi which means finding india in china in chinese the subtitle travels to the lesser known travels can be both real and metaphorical well the subtitle travels to the lesser known indicates that the book dips into the lesser known um facets or sides of india and china this book is actually written in the manner of a travelog but it's not quite a travelog this book takes you to seven different parts or seven different places in china some of them are cities some of them are uh, provinces you know provinces in in uh, china are called states in india and i'll be using the term interchangeably so yes seven places and why these seven places why did i pick up these particularly these seven places in china because these places reminded me of india one way or the other some of you present here must be in the know of China's eastern coastline cities such as Shanghai, Beijing, uh, Tianjin, Shenzhen, Guangzhou. China's eastern coast is also called China's golden necklace. It's called China's golden coastline. Imagine writing a book about China and writing about Beijing and Shanghai. Imagine writing a book about India 
and writing about Delhi and Bombay. Imagine writing a book about Singapore and writing about Orchard Road and River Valley. These places or these paths are not truly representative of India, China or Singapore. And this is precisely what I have done with respect to China, the less known, less frequented corners in the heartlands or in the periphery. Well, this book begins with a map, as you can see, and this map tells you about all the places that I've talked about in India and in China. So let me begin by taking you to, to Xinjiang. Xinjiang, as you know, is a province in China. It's in the extreme western, westernmost periphery of China. It, it is almost 3,000 kilometers away from Beijing, the capital. It's in a different time zone. It has a very long border, a long shared border with Central Asia, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, and even Pakistan. Some of you present here might have heard of the Taklamakan Desert, that's in Xinjiang. Some of you present here might have heard of the Tarim Basin, well, all the cities in southern Xinjiang are oasis towns on the rim of the Tarim Basin. What is the landscape of Xinjiang like? Try to imagine it. Very stunning landscape, a little bleak. Think about fruit valleys, think about icy peaks, placid lakes. In fact, the heavenly mountains are in Xinjiang and the heavenly lake is also in Xinjiang. On this note of heaven, let me take you to Kashmir. Kashmir is also in the periphery of India, northernmost tip of India. The distance from Kashmir to Kanyakumari is more than 3,000 kilometers. And some of you present here might have heard of the Emperor Shah Jahan. I hope some of the men here in this room might take a cue from the Emperor Shah Jahan. He was the emperor who built the Grand Taj Mahal in the memory of his wife. Well, Shah Jahan had a minister, a minister by the name of Sadullah. And this is what Sadullah had to say about Kashmir. If there is a paradise on earth, it is this, it is this, Oh, it is this. So the landscape of Kashmir is absolutely stunning. India generally appears like a profusion of banana trees or coconut trees or mango trees, but not Kashmir. If you go to Kashmir, you'll actually walk into apple orchards, into thick forests of conifer, into rolling hills of walnut trees, into tall icy peaks and beautiful lakes. What do the people of Kashmir look like? Well, as you can see, I'm brown skinned, but the people of Kashmir are not brown skinned like me. They have a lighter skin and most of them have very tall noses. So they look more Central Asian rather than people like me. Kashmir can actually be divided into three parts. There is a Hindu part, there is a Muslim part, and there is a Buddhist part. And last but not the least, Kashmir is a Muslim majority province or a Muslim majority state. On this note, let me take you back to Xinjiang. Who are the people of Xinjiang? They are the Uyghurs. And who are the Uyghurs? The Uyghurs are the Turkic Muslims. They don't look Chinese, they don't speak Chinese. They don't eat uh, steamed fish or dim sum. So what do the Uyghurs eat? It's very rustic and rugged and wholesome fare. Nang bread and shish kebabs, polo or pulao, and muraba, which is fruits cooked with sugar. Did Xinjiang remind me of Kashmir? Well, yes, both are troubled provinces, both 
adrift with rivers of blood, both seething with discontent. Both provinces or states want to break away and both have a contested history. Let me now take you to the second province, Kansu. G-A-N-S-U, it's pronounced as Kansu. It's one of the poorest places in China. The capital of Kansu is a city called Lanzhou. Lanzhou is the geographic center of China, right in the middle of China. And it's on the banks of the famous Yellow River. In fact, I did my fieldwork in Kansu province and I'll be reading from this particular chapter, so I won't uh, discuss it too much. Uh, my, I, I worked on poverty alleviation in India and China, and the bottom line that I found was that uh, China had moved away from subsidies, which it referred to as, as uh, blood, trans, blood transfusion, and focused more on what it called blood forming policies in the in the rural part of Kansu. The third place that uh, I went to or I, I, I'm talking about is uh, Xi'an. Xi'an is a city. It's very famous for the terracotta warriors. I went to Xi'an and I was of course fascinated by the terracotta warriors. It's the mausoleum of the first emperor, Qin Shi Huang, who unified China. But as much as I was fascinated by the, the terracotta warriors, I was fascinated by a large neighborhood, a large Hui Muslim neighborhood. So the Hui's are a different kind of Muslims. They're not like the Uyghurs of Xinjiang. They, they were born out of the intermarriage of Arab or Persian traders with local Chinese women. This explains why they're very Chinese in looks, but they're Muslim by religion. The Hui are a very peculiar Chinese in China. Uh, if, you, if you go to Xi'an and if you go into a mosque of the Hui, it looks more like a Chinese pagoda a lot of the Hues also eat pork. But on the other hand, you also have the Hues who read the Quran five times a day. They eat halal food and they hope to go for the Hajj. So in a, in a sense, they straddle both the Chinese world and the Islam, Islamic world. But the Chinese don't consider them Chinese enough and the Muslims don't consider them Muslim enough. So now you can understand their anxiety and their angst in, in China. So as you can see, you can sense the narrative of the book. It is not about finding India and China because China eats curry or because China eats biryani. It is very abstract. I'm finding China either in the history or in the geography or in the issues that, uh, that are common to India and China. The fourth place is, uh, is a place called Kaifeng. And uh, could one of you in the audience tell me what, what was it about Kaifeng that reminded me of India? And the person who can guess it will actually get a book for free. Well, both India and China have been very welcoming of outsiders or foreigners. But the way the foreigners or the outsiders are assimilated or embraced is very different in India and it's very different in China. I'm not saying that what China does is the wrong thing, but there are multiple ways of doing and viewing. So uh, Kaifeng is is very famous because it has a very small colony of Jews. They call the orphan colony of Jews. In fact, in the 19th century, it was a British philanthropist, James Finn, who wrote this book called The Orphan Colony of Jews in, in Kaifeng. 
uh, and similarly you find a very small colony of Jews in a place called Cochin. Cochin is a place on the Malabar coast. Some of you, in fact, most of you present here might have been to a cold storage at some point in time. You might have seen a pepper mill which says Jamie Olivier's Telly Cherry Peppercorns. Well, those Telly Cherry Peppercorns are from the Malabar coast, which is the south uh, western coast of India. It actually took Jamie Olivier to put the Telly Cherry uh, Peppercorns as a gourmet offering. So, Cochin has a small colony of Jews but what has become of the Jews in Kaifeng and what has become of the Jews in Cochin in Kaifeng the Jews have been what has been called assimilated out of existence as somebody in Kaifeng told me the Jews have become Chinese but the Chinese have not become the Jews but if you go to Cochin the Jews still continue to to exist as a distinct era despite uh, despite the fact that numbers have dwindled due to mass alia to to nevatim in israel uh, if you see the small jewish colony the small jewish settlement you'll find that most of the households don't mix meat and milk they eat kosher and they have mezuzahs hanging outside the doorway or the Star of David hanging uh, outside the doorway. Xiamen. Xiamen is again a city and this is a place which is on the eastern coast. It is actually on the Golden Coast Line. But I haven't talked about the glamour and glitz of uh, Xiamen because Xiamen, as you know, is a special economic zone. I have um, written about the gritty side of uh, Xiamen. Xiamen, as you know, was the first port of emigration. This was the port from which the Chinese set out for the Nanyang or the Southern Seas. This was the port that all the Chinese who wanted to, to seek a fortune, the adventurers, they were the ones who left from this port for Indonesia or Philippines or, or even the Strait Settlement. Similarly, you have Bombay, and Bombay has also been a very old port of emigration. Uh, as I mentioned, Xiamen is a special economic zone, and Bombay, as you know, is a city of opportunity. And today, both Xiamen and Bombay attract a lot of migrants. And so, there is the narrative about both these cities on the coast very welcoming of the adventurers but on the other hand as you know china has a hukou or a household registration system every individual in china has to have a hukou and it is the hukou or the household registration that defines you you are either an urban citizen or you are a rural citizen so it it is if you look at it in 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 one way pretty much like india's caste system which stamps you of of a as of a particular caste so huko is is not because you buy it or because you seek it or because it comes naturally to you it is by virtue of birth and it is very similar to the caste system which also comes to you by virtue of birth. Can you change your hukou? Yes, there is a procedure to change your hukou, but it is rather long, bureaucratic and tedious. And similarly, can you change your caste? Yes, you can, but it's again a very tedious and long drawn out process. Chapter six is Inner Mongolia. Inner Mongolia, compared with Rajasthan in India. You might have heard of Inner Mongolia. Pretty much a hot favorite with the tourists in the tourist circuit. Both Mongolia and Rajasthan have a long history of warfare and conquest, of feudalism and hierarchy. So what has happened 
what has become of the Mongols in Mongolia. Well, the Mongols were the nomads, nomads in search of water and grass. So how are the nomads eking out an existence, eking out a living in times of globalization? Well, by pandering to their ethnicity. If you go to Mongolia, you'll find a pretty Mongol girl in Mongol attire welcome you. You'll find tour operators who sell you the grasslands gala. You have lots of tours to the steppes, horse tours, the Nadam festival, archery, wrestling. The Mongols were once outside of the Great Wall of China. The Mongols were the ones who actually uh, were the founders of modern day Peking. It was Marco Polo who went to Peking and call it, called it Khanbalik, Kambaluk. So the Mongols, once, uh, once outsiders outside of the Great Wall, are now insiders inside, inside the Great Wall. And they were once terrifying warriors. But now, pandering to tourists and tourism, they seem less than terrifying. And the last chapter, touching again a city. This city is in Manchuria. Manchuria is in the northeastern part of China. Some of the Indians present here in the audience may know that chicken Manchurian is a favorite dish in India, but there is no chicken Manchurian or or uh, vegetable Manchurian to be found in China for uh, the eating. Uh, so yes, I went to Taqing and Taqing is an iconic socialist town. If you studied China at any point in time, there was no way that you would not study or read about uh, Taqing. Uh, Taqing is pretty much synonymous with one of Mao's very famous quotes. In industry, learn from Taqing. In agriculture, learn from Taqai. So both of these places were model places. Um, they were backwater towns, but they upheld the socialist dream. Taqing is of particular significance because this was the place in China where they first found petroleum which is why it was called Ta. Ta, ta means big and Ching means celebration. Cause for big celebration. Finding petroleum when China lacked the precious resource. So if you go to Ta Ching, you'll find this massive monument. It's a monument to the model, sold, uh, model worker, uh, uh, worker by the name of Wang Jinshi. So I went inside the monument and I found it fairly deserted. It was hardly a soul. It was a very swanky monument, air conditioned, very, um, everything was, you know, very spick and span, but no, no people for uh, a model worker. So I asked one of the, the, the visitors that, uh, did he really admire Wang Jinshi? the model worker that that uh, socialist China worshipped and he said that he didn't so I asked him who is your icon or who is your role model uh, in, in post-reform China and he said it was Liu Wan. Liu Wan as you know is a supermodel she is China's Jennifer Aniston or China's Kate Moss and she's the one who runs on the runway wearing Victoria's Secret. So what a dramatic transition for China from socialism to, to economic reform, from Mao to market. So I'll read a little bit from one of the chapters so that you get a feel of what this book, uh, what this book is about, uh, layered with history, with politics, and with geography. And I'm going to be reading from the chapter Kansu. It is probably apt to describe the road to Kansu province, approximately 1,500 kilometer west of Beijing, as a road 
less traveled. In fact, a famous anthropologist called Kansu province as the periphery of the periphery. So Kansu is a very far-flung province and it is infamously known amongst India's China's hands as China's Bihar. Bihar is one of the poorest provinces in uh, India. So it's a region of backwardness and poverty and this province is located on the fringes of China's northwestern frontier, squeezed between Inner Mongolia, which I just spoke about, and Qinghai, which is the Dalai Lama's birthplace, as well as the equally forlorn Ningxia, ill-reputed as a dumping ground for political prisoners and inglorious riffraff. One can easily agree with the famous anthropologist G. William Skinner's description of Kansu as periphery of the periphery, a truly frontier province is quite apropos. Even in academic circles, the northwestern frontier has solicited precious little attention, described by the historian Jonathan Lipman as being a region of rough wilderness, sparse population, lawlessness, distance from the affairs of greater society, or as a Chinese academic described it, the lame leg of the giant. So cliche or otherwise, Kansu is as Bihar as can be. Yet such sweeping generalizations completely gloss over the critical historical value of this unique place. So the westernmost terminus of the Great Wall begins here in Kansu and it winds its way across the swath of China's northern steppes and its expansive desert all the way north of the capital Peqing and finally ends in Manchuria. So Kansu was also a very famous stop on the famous Silk Road. Silk Route, the caravans had to pass through Kansu to reach Central Asia. It was thus a critical passage into China and out of China. I traveled to Kansu several times beginning in 2001 because the remote Tingxi County, apparently the poorest county in, in, in China with nine routes in 10 years was identified by a senior Indophile in Beijing as my field area for research on poverty. When I ask my friends in Beijing or I ask my friends in Shanghai if they've ever heard of Tingxi County, they say they've never heard of this place. It's just too far off, too inconspicuous, too much of a little small, well, I won't say red dot, too much of a small dot on the map. So Kansu is generally considered Luan. I'm sure some of you understand what Luan means. It's a Chinese word which means chaotic, read thieves, moraders, pickpockets, and unconfirmed danger. Of course, it does not help that the average Chinese categorizes India as Luan, disorder, chaotic, and not given to easy navigation. So that's a very popular or common perception of India in in, in China. I did not know that the provincial capital of Kansu, Lancho, was located at the geographic center. It's on the banks of the famous Yellow River. It's considered China's mother river and cradle of civilization. My memories of Lancho are of giant billboards. You generally don't find so many billboards in China especially billboards with a political slogan. You find um, billboards all over the place in China, uh, in India with political slogans, but not in, not in China. But I found billboards in Lancho that line the main street from the train station to the city. Back then in 2001, party-sponsored billboards depicting party leaders were not so common in Shanghai, but it seemed different in faraway Lancho. I realized that these billboards were a proclamation of the then president Jiang Zemin's grand strategy 
to open up the West. Some of you might have heard it, heard about open up the West strategy, because China's interior or Western China is poor and backward. So the open up the West strategy held the promise that things would change in the Western regions or interior China. As I mentioned, the interior China is China's ugly duckling. What with its cursed geography of arid deserts and barren mountains, the promise was that the heavy investment would turn the West into a beautiful swan. I came to understand the rhetoric. Lancho was a sprawling grey mass of a city. In fact, it's one of the most polluted cities in China. It was choked by a thick cloud of noxious smog. In the distant skyline, there were factories that billowed smoke and putrid stench of rotting flesh wafted in the air. And Lancho seemed to be stuck in a weird, in a very weird Stalinist uh, warp. So the last section that I'm going to read is actually about my field work in, in the poorest county of China, in one of the poorest provinces in China. So Tingxi, the name of the county which was assigned to me, was a little over a hundred kilometers from Lancho, a journey made trying by the zigzag curves of the rugged mountainous road. The journey was defined by the color of the landscape, brown and bare mountains with sparse reeds, gangly trees and the brown parched earth that thirsted for water. So this is an arid part of China, it's a very dry part of China. Sometimes a lone Muslim cemetery with a green crescent moon flag broke the monotony of the practically bare hillside. At other times there was a shabby Chinese motel, a patch of land being worked on by a lone farmer wearing a large straw hat and trudging with his donkey. This is not what you would see in Shanghai, this is not what you would see in Shenzhen or Tianjin or Beijing. Under the scorching sun, impressed that this place was not entirely shown of human existence. If anything, this was a far cry from China's glittering eastern coast. So this was nothing glamorous, or glimmering or glitzy about interior China. When the car entered Tingxi, it seemed strangely familiar, giving the impression of a small inconspicuous Indian district. Tingxi was a nondescript little place that one could happily navigate by foot. Unlike India, it was primarily built in concrete. In India, you would find dirt roads, you would find, you wouldn't find any concrete in the Indian uh, villages. But here in China, it had smart squat shops and double-storied supermarkets and well-paved pavements. There were large billboards which drew my uh, attention. They read Tingxi, Potato County of China. So the only thing that grew in poverty is potato joked my middle-aged companion by the name of Yang. So in China, you simply can't scoot off for your field work. You usually have a minder or a companion. And in this case, the middle-aged Miss Yang was, was my minder. So potato was, by the way, the only thing that the Chinese did not eat much of. And yet Westerners loved it, she said with a laugh. Yang was surprised to learn that potato curry or fried potatoes or mashed potatoes were staples of the poor in India. So what, what, is, what do the poor people uh, in India eat? It's usually rice and potatoes. The first stop was the county office. The county office was a very modest but busy place. It was teeming with villagers who wanted an audience with the county head. Clerks and county officials sat with piles of dusty files and the place reeked of strong Chinese tea. Most of the staff looked at me with wide-eyed wonder. I was the first Indian. I mean, you can imagine this is Western China. This is interior China. It's a very small county. 
and I, I have actually I actually visited this county and I was the first Indian they were they had ever seen in flesh and blood they fawned so much so that I felt like an important uh, visiting dignitary the new India from old Bollywood movies and there I was perhaps putting a face to their idea of India they asked why I did not have a red dot on my forehead a matter of personal choice I explained they showed me to the washroom apologizing that the poor county had terrible facilities and surely India would be leaps ahead one of them got me a cup of Chinese tea apologetic that there was no coke to offer I did not wait long. A clerk ushered me into an acid blue room with a portly figure sitting in a cloud of smoke, a retinue of villagers at hand. And the county head looked every bit a greasy communist, sort of a spy's nightmare. This is, you know, stereotypical communist that we often think of in India. Um, well, he shot off routine questions, where I was from, what was the purpose of my visit, and how nice it was to have a visitor from a faraway land. This is the right place, he enthused, signing a letter for me to pass down the chain. So China is very hierarchical, they're from the top right down to the bottom, even when it's fieldwork. So my eyes traveled around in the room and rested on a bronze plaque on the wall. It said that Tingxi was a model county. I, I hope you understand the significance of model county. Model county visited by none other than the now former President Jiang Zemin. The thought of fieldwork in a model county in China was an immediate dampener. It's an open secret that model counties are made for show in this case, showcasing the best foot forward of poverty. And I was in the middle of it, very far away. I had come from a very far away place. I traveled to the interior, to the poorest place, to the poorest county, and I was going to the poorest village. And the poorest place was a model county. Afterwards, I was treated to a starch heavy meal in a Tingshi restaurant. A blur of potato fritters, chicken with potatoes, and potato pancake. The finely shredded potato and green pepper seasoned with vinegar was appetizing. In China's poorest place, the delicious treat was one fit for a king. Thank you. <laughs>